Hi, I am Jamin. I am back. In today's agenda, I am going to deconstruct the propaganda and to find out that how many people are aware about the leftist thinkers and the libertarians. And I want to let you know that how far uh, the government has successfully, you know, indoctrinated our own people. So let's figure it out in today's session. Do you know any one of these? Uh, yeah, I know this guy. He's a MN boy. Six Okay. Uh, uh, Karl Marx. Uh, Lenin. Okay. Uh, Mao. Do you know who you are from? No. He's a Japan guy. He's a Japan guy? And you've seen them. 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 They're communists. You've seen them. Who's the one from them? No. Do you know who you are? 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 Anyone? Please, 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 Acha, anything else you want to speak? Um, Do you think it's a good idea? I guess. How it is a good idea? So I don't get to tell you. Like, how, how it is a good idea? How do you know it's a good idea? Good idea? Yeah. Um, Do you, you believe that communism is a good idea, right? No, I, I just said you. Know. Acha, that's it? You know only mom? Yeah. Anyone else, guys? Anyone here? Anything more about mom? Yeah, he started as a party, he's a communist party in China. Okay. That's it. Are you going to tell me English? Okay. Where are you from? Where are you from? Where are you from? Where are you from? अच्छा और इनमें से और कोई जाता कोई पसंद है इनमें से थैंक यू फॉर दिस बट इनमें से फिर भी आप कभी सुने हो इनके बारे में ओके थैंक्स अब बता तू इसमें से किन को क्या जाता आ ये काल बाग से ना अच्छा और और ये लेने ने अच्छा और इनको ये कौन है ये जानते ही नहीं तो नहीं इनके बारे में कभी सुना ही नहीं नहीं टेक्सबुक्स के में टेक्सबुक्स में इनको देखा है और ये भी अलग रही है कौन है ये ये और डिक्टेटर है ना ये हाँ कहाँ के मतलब और एशियन है अच्छा एशियन है गर्लफ्रेंड ने बता नहीं क्या कौन किधर गया तो किसके बारे में कभी सुना है तूने कुछ? नहीं पढ़ा है लेकिन इतना जानता तो नहीं हूँ मैं। किसके बारे में पढ़ा है? ये इसके बारे में। कौन है ये? इसलिए मैं पढ़ा था लेकिन अभी नाम याद नहीं है मुझे। क्या याद है? सलमान खान की पहली गर्लफ्रेंड? नहीं 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 नहीं। फिर अच्छा अच्छा ये रहेगा अच्छा टेल मी मोर अबाउट हर इन थिंग ऑल पढ़ी थी मैंने एंड थिंग करी ओके सो व्हाट शी क्लेमर्स फॉर लाइक व्हाट शी बिलीव्स इन आई थिंक लिमिटेड गवर्नमेंट अच्छा कम इंटरवेंशन होना चाहिए ग्रेट आई मीन या कूल देन गो एंड कम इंटरवेंशन होना चाहिए पब्लिक की लाइफ में और पब्ल Finally, I got a sane person to talk with. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because uh, it's like I've been interacting and okay. uh, people say they don't know more about uh, these thinkers, the libertarians, they know more about communists. And you know, communism is such a dangerous ideology that expands the size of the government, the power of the government and the cost of individual liberty. Finally, you are the only person who is saying it. Thank God. Hi, <laughs> My fellow sheep, election season is upon us. Are you one of the 12% of Americans who still approves of our government? Then we need your help to force the other 88% into compliance. 
Our democracy depends on it. We're an organization called Citizens Against Too Much Unfettered Freedom, or CATMUF. CATMUF is a bipartisan flock of sheep whose goal is expanding government until nothing else remains. Because the government is here to help you. How can you help CATMUF help you? By only voting for candidates dedicated to expanding government. It's easy. You don't need to study the issues. No matter what a politician says when running for office, they're all dedicated to expanding government. And make sure you tell all your friends and family to vote for more government. Here at CATMUF, we don't care if you vote Democrat or Republican, as long as you vote for candidates committed to growing our federal family. CATMUF. Because folks just aren't smart enough to handle real freedom. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network on theconsciousresistance.com and the SOL, the SOL podcast.org. So today I'm delighted to have Jamin Vaishnav, who comes in from Mumbai, India. Uh, it's not an easy recording because it's like 5.30 in the morning over there. So please excuse him. He's, he's doing a lot for this being on here. I'm very grateful. Uh, he's an individualist libertarian and an anarcho-capitalist. He's also a university professor uh, where he teaches journalism, sociology, international business, and economics, among other things. And you can find him uh, on Facebook, uh, Jamin uh, Vaishnav on Facebook. And then his YouTube channel is called Jamin Triggered. We'll put the link in the comment, uh, in the description below. And you can find him on Twitter at Meritocratic. Uh, and then also he um, contributes to a, a website called ActualAnarchy.com. So we're going to talk about um, his path to volunteerism and free markets, uh, who influenced him, books, books that influenced him. And uh, and in some of his videos from his, uh, from his YouTube channel, he uh, did a great one about um, taxation and theft. <clears throat> I think he was doing graffiti on some government buildings, uh, which is pretty fun <laughs> to watch. And he also did a great one, Man in the Street um, in video, which is like a social experiment where he was he was uh, determining how much people in uh, in his part of the world understand, you know, what communism is, what socialism is, and uh, of course what free market capitalism is and uh and it was very um illuminating video to say the least so um so yeah we're going to talk about that so uh jamin thank you thanks a lot for coming on the show yeah thanks a lot and thank you for the brief introduction <laughs> so good evening to you and it's morning here yeah. yeah i know right <laughs> <laughs> i'm sure i'm sure that's something that you gotta deal with a lot right a lot of people uh have uh you know their podcasts I, I guess a lot of podcasters in this um uh, sphere are from the united states right so <laughs> something you got to deal with um so yeah so please get into your um you know your your path to how you came to this philosophy of volunteerism and free markets oh well uh Basically, it's like uh, I used to be a Marxist and uh, I was, you know, I was kind of a socialist. So I think uh, Orkut was quite popular uh, 10 years back and there were many communities. So I just got introduced to this word called anarchism. So I just, you know, curiosity is the best teacher. So I just happened to Google this word called anarchism. And before, like, you know, uh, before 10 years, I never was introduced to anarchism because, you know, it's considered as a dirty word and we don't have even at our primary school level that we are taught what exactly is freedom or anarchism. So uh, I think uh, internet has played a huge role in uh, shaping my way of thinking in, in the way I learn and the way I've become uh, autodidact. So, so I believe that, uh, you know, uh, Wikipedia or other websites, you know, I was not quite acquainted with all these anarchist websites that are so much in numbers today that we see in comparison to the last 10 years. And following Facebook discussions, you know, followed thereafter from Orkut because Orkut failed in the market because of lack of innovation that we had Facebook. So on Facebook, I saw many anarchist libertarian communities. So I was a slow learner and I was trying to understand, uh, you know, a very different ideology in, you know, in this setup because most of the people are obsessed either with democracy, either with dictatorship. So anarchism is something that goes above both the ideologies. It, it, it does not fall in any of the spectrum because anarchism is about freedom and freedom cannot be limited as long as it is responsible. So uh, 
two friends, uh, Vinit and Arvind uh, on Facebook, they're also my Facebook friends, have played a huge role in shaping my views and all. Uh, both of them continue to be libertarians, and I have just shifted from being a libertarian to anarchism. I used to support small government, but I think uh, uh, you know small government is also a contradiction when it comes to action or delivery of services. So that has been my journey, and then uh, you know I entered the profession of teaching in 2012. So I got a computer on my desk, so I used to use it productively. So I started visiting Mrs.org, you know, that's the mm. site, and I started watching some YouTube channels and all. So yeah, so since there is too much of free literature available on internet on anarchism and liberty, so I started reading books. I got a Kindle. I used to develop regular habits on reading all these ideologies, and then I started, you know, talking about it in my classes. And you know, it it is really sickening. It is really shocking that. You know, we do not teach the other side of the coin. We are quite obsessed with Keynesian theories. Mm. We are quite obsessed with socialism. We are quite obsessed with Marx. I mean, Marx is more popular than even God today, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> he's a, yeah. So he's a you know kind of a saint that has become so popular for all the wrong reasons, though people are not able to logically decipher it. So it was a gradual shift. You know, it took me like minimum uh, five to eight years from coming from left side to the right side and moving beyond the right. Mm. So uh, I think that has been my journey of uh, learning about anarchism. And today I have like a uh, good uh, or say sufficient knowledge to understand anarchism and, you know, function smoothly in this way. Yeah, you know, I see so often that, you know, so many instances of proof showing me that the internet is such a powerful tool to spread information, you know, and has done such wonderful things um, because, you know, before, right, you had, uh, let's say, like, you know, I always compare the, the appearance of the Internet to the Gutenberg Press in the 15th century, you know, when, when literature was like, um, it was um, confined to just, you know, the religious clergy who understood how to read the Bible like in Latin, you know, and everyone else just had to rely on them to interpret the Bible. And then all of a sudden the Gutenberg Press comes out and not only can it be mass produced, but it can be translated into the various languages, the vernacular, the local languages. And all of a sudden there's an explosion in information and people are exposed to this and they can read the Bible directly and, and how that's such a wonderful thing. And to me, the same thing, you know, it's analogous to the Internet in, in that it provides people with easy access to information. And that can only be a good thing, you know, like like the, what you were talking about, all these free websites, Mises.org, YouTube, Wikipedia. And, and yeah. yeah, so to me, it's just like it's a wonderful thing and it's and it's phasing out, you know, talking about university. I, th I, I think universities and colleges are, for the most part, defunct institutions like on their way out. It's like when so many things, when, when so many um, skills and um, so much knowledge can be acquired online for free, when, when you know the right places to go, like what, you know, what, why would people pay, you know, uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars to go to an institution? You know, it just doesn't make sense anymore. It's like, it's like a dinosaur. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, you know, uh, people just pursue education as a sign of formality. I mean, there is right. no knowledge, there is only information. So uh, due to this, you know, we are not able to develop thinkers. So when you, when I look at students, I just don't look at them as a skilled robots. Hmm. I, you know, I, I have a very different perspective towards my students. And, you know, the, the you know, education playing to play a huge role. And, you know, it's it's this kind of a pressure that builds on your cognition, it builds on your personality that automatically you start learning and learning has to be continuous and evolving. It cannot be just like communist where you are just stuck at a particular school of thought. I think, you know, yeah. a lot can be done through education as long as it is peaceful. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and the other thing that you mentioned to me um, was that you consider yourself an autodidact. And I think yeah. a lot of people who come to volunteerism and free markets um, and, and understand it, you have to be an autodidact. You have to be thirsty and hungry for this knowledge. And you have to, you know, just want to consume as much as possible because there's so much information out there to consume. And it's it's so, um, 
it's it's confusing especially for people like you know, you said you came from the left, right? So, you know, it's going to yeah. be very confusing. Like, imagine somebody coming, you know, you're on the left and somebody come to you and try to convince you of all this stuff. You're going to reject it immediately. But if you if you pursue it yourself and you out of curiosity for discovering, you know, the truth, discovering um, what is objective and, and what is, um, you know, what's, what is economics? You know, <laughs> why do why do people act the way they do? You know, it, it's it's a, it's an amazing thing when people have that curiosity to educate themselves. And and I think, you know, that's that's the reason that I have my channel, my podcast, right? Trying to educate people and contribute to the wealth of knowledge that's already in existence. And, uh, you know, so, yeah, that's my goal. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, people generally have this popular belief that anything that is mainstream is always moral, is always logical, but that is not always the case. Right. Anything that is mainstream could be legal, but you cannot have, you cannot mix uh, morality with legality. Right. So anything that is not mainstream, you know, that is the science of human action. I think that is more about economics. I think that is the real economics. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. yeah, so so please, um, yeah, please get into... Uh, let's see your your video. So you talked. Well, actually, before we get into your video, let, let me just ask you: Who, um, like, what books have you read that really influenced you? And you know, authors and and what like podcasts or YouTube channels really influenced you along the way? Uh, uh, okay. Uh, so I think uh, Wikipedia, you know, and some other blogging websites. I'm not able to remember the domain. Uh, they have helped me a lot uh, during the primary stage when I was uh, introduced to libertarianism or even economics. Uh, so I think I would credit them and then followed after that Mises Institute, fe.org, yeah, yeah. uh, you know, even books, novels by Ayn Rand, though I don't agree with her, but her books have also played a huge role. George Orwell's 1984 Animal Farm, I think it is completely right. relevant in today's time. So, and even I suggest these books to my students because, you know, I don't want them to experience the same uh, dilemma that I faced it. Mm. So I think it's kind of a social work, unnoticed social work, which I am doing in academia. So human action, uh, you know, and, and introduction to economic reasoning, Jonathan Galibal by Ken Schooland. I think these books have played a huge role in uh, looking at the way I used to look at economics. You said you said you, you read Human Human Action by by Mises. Yeah. Wow, yeah, yeah, the yeah. huge book. <laughs> yeah, it's like <laughs> I would say it's the Bible of economics. I mean, uh, yeah. it's, uh, it it needs to be that. I mean, you can't ignore reading Human Action. No. I mean, it doesn't make sense to read the general theory of money, credit, and all. I mean, John Minute Keynes right. is completely irrelevant. I mean, <laughs> uh, the biggest tragedy of our civilization is his existence. So I think. <laughs> So I think human action would make more sense. Yeah. I think we should, uh, you know, give a due publicity to human action. Uh, podcast, I think Stephen Clyde, you, uh, Amit Verma's podcast, I mean, uh, he's also a libertarian based in Mumbai. Just two days back, he wrote on taxation and theft on a mainstream newspaper mm. called Times of India. So, uh, you know, uh, for the I think for the first time, you know, it was introduced. Yeah. But I'm quite unaware of the outcome, like whether how the people reaction and all. Mm -hmm. So I think your podcast, I mean, you are doing awesome work. I mean, peaceful anarchism is really, I mean, it completely in sync, you know. Anarchism is peaceful and peace is anarchism, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And the liberty is something that is a soul of both the concepts. Right. So, you know, I really enjoy listening to your podcast. Wonderful. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, my when I first made this um when I first made my website, I remember talking to my wife, uh, you know, I, I wanted to have anarchism in the name, but my wife was uncomfortable because, you know, it sounds like a very um um contentious and inflammatory word. And so I'm like, all right, so let's put the word peaceful there so that clear up any confusion <laughs> that people might have if they get scared by the word anarchism. So, uh, so yeah, that, I think that kind of helps in that, you know, because if we just say, if we just say we're anarchists, then of course they're immediately going to believe that we, you know, we just want to bomb people and, you know, and cause disorder and chaos. But, um, you know, so we really have to advocate that, no, of course not, you know. I mean, I mean, it's, it's kind of funny that people who know me think that because I have, I'm, I'm a homeschooling father. I have two kids. I, I have um, an eight-year-old son and a six-year-old daughter, right? And so if I told them I'm an anarchist and they think that I want to cause disorder, I'm like, what do you, what do you mean I want to cause disorder? I have two little kids. What kind of disorder <laughs> would I want to cause? <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's ridiculous. So like, like you know, all I, my goal, my objective 
is is yeah. education is education providing people with information to improve their lives to better understand the world and you know one of the best ways i describe what i do is i try to i try to spread philosophy morality and economics to me those awesome. are the, those are the basic the basic things and then you know once you understand those then you know then volunteerism and anarchism and capitalism they um i think they just come naturally right so yeah. so yeah so that's kind of uh that's kind of me, and and uh, you know, of course, when I first introduced myself to people, I don't call myself an anarchist, but I just, <laughs> you know, I talk to them, and and uh, you know, I, I kind of help them establish that I'm a decent, you know, moral, kind-hearted, compassionate human being, you know, and that's it. And then, oh, by the way, I'm an anarchist. After they know me, they're like, oh, you're an anarchist? What? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, you know, uh, the word anarchism has been widely abused. I mean, it is being used as a wrong connotation. It is used as a negative feature. But, uh, you know, I mean, that's not the way. I mean, anarchism truly believes in non-aggression principle. It doesn't believe in aggressing violence. But unfortunately, the mainstream uh, public sphere has played a huge role, or you can say a destructive role in defaming the word anarchism. But when it comes to educating people, we I just cannot start directly. I'm an anarchist because people develop the perspectives and outlook, you right, know, a kind right. of schema. Yeah. So it makes sense to indirectly talk about and make them question about tax, make them question about their freedom, and make them question about their uh, relationship with the government with reference to accountability. So you know, people get easily, you know, get listening to you. So that makes sense. That could be a beautiful strategy in education to start with. Yeah. So, so let me ask you when you, when you, um, uh, meet someone from new for the first time and you want to introduce them to these topics, how do you go about doing that? Uh, I use Socratic method in my teaching. So, you know, that makes sense that that creates a culture of participation. And I think, uh, anarchism is about having conversations yeah. and I think conversations are quite important in, uh, smoothening, uh, you know, our ideological introduction. So I never start directly saying that let's not have a government. Right. You know, right. let's let's let I give them a case study. Okay, now you are policy in charge. Now you have government having so many powers. You know, the government in India has banned beef. The government is not in the mood to legalize homosexuality. So don't you think it is government's business to tell us what we should do, what we should eat, what we should not drink? Mm. I don't think it's government business. And most of today's youngsters believe, you know, uh, in in a kind of freedom but they exactly don't know in which direction should they be you know mm -hmm. going ahead so i think uh, uh, this is where the leftists have you know uh, almost hijacked their mind or like somewhere okay let's have a freedom but then we have a, a equality we need equality we need to be socially responsible person so i say no you can be socially responsible only when you're individually responsible so with individual responsibility, you know, you can do many other magical things and greater things in the society. So, you know, this becomes a primary session in case study. Then I give them, okay, there are so many tax labs, there are so many tax rates. So is it is it morally good that, you know, the government collects taxes at gunpoint? Is it morally good that, you know, we should not progress more so that when we progress more, we pay more taxes? So. Don't you think it is wrong? I mean, progress is a sign of prosperity, and mm. prosperity is the feature of our civilization. Right. So, you know, this is where they start thinking, you know. So it takes time. It takes minimum three, four weeks for them to understand the whole uh, equation. And thereafter, you know, you start telling them, okay, go back, read about free market anarchism, read this book called Human Action, read this book called Jonathan Gallibel. So, you know, people start reading it. And once they start reading it, you know, then they understand, okay, yeah, this is a problem. We never saw this problem. We never realized this problem. You know, like how Frederick Bastiat in his the book called The Law talks about the scene side and the unseen side. Mm. So we are quite obsessed with the scene side. We we never calculate the cost of the unseen side. Right. You know? Yeah. Yeah, there's there's a, uh, a YouTube channel. I'm not sure if you follow it, but it's called Learn Liberty. And there yeah. you do follow, yeah, awesome YouTube channel. I love it. And and one yeah. one video um, reminds me of, uh, of when I think of India because they they talk about uh, well, I mean a few videos. Like one of them was about sweatshops and how sweatshops lift help lift people out of poverty. That's one. That's one video. That's one, one of them. And then another one is talking about how 
uh, you know, some people will say when they think of capitalism, they think of the rich and the poor, right? And the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer, right? People often think about it. the divide is, good, is increasing, right? Whereas what really uh, has happened as a result of technological innovation and prosperity and, you know, um, innovation is that, um, not yes, the rich have gotten richer, you know, we, we have gotten many, many more luxuries in our lives, but um, proportionally speaking, the poor have also gotten richer, and probably more so. Like, like you know, like like the you know the, the a rich person, let's say I don't know, hundred years ago, or maybe let's say fifty years ago, they could have a, a car, a nice car, right? And then today they can have maybe a nicer car, right? But they still have a car. Whereas the poor, you know, fifty years ago, most m- most people did not have cars, and now you know things are getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, right? As as um people, you know, we're getting more productive and more efficient with um you know with the way we produce these um these goods and so more and more people are having access to basic um luxuries like cars like air conditioning you know like like um um <laughs> clothes and shoes just basic stuff you know that most people take for granted and and those are the kind of things that has helped to um lift the poor out of poverty and to provide them with material comforts that for most of human history you know people have not had <laughs> you know so so th- that's what yeah. i think when i think of india is that is that they're uh you know one of the one of the countries that has been helped the most by capitalism I, what's your perspective on that uh yeah that's a very uh you know interesting case uh, i would like to you know cite the example of milton friedman milton friedman traveled to india in 1970s and uh, you know uh, he made a documentary that you know why the handloom industry in india is not progressing it's not competitive and why it is running in loss in 1970s that is because from the period of 1950 till 1990 uh, india was a closed economy we practiced license raj system where everything was almost everything was regulated licensed and all mm. so due to regulations and licenses you never become rich you become poor uh logically i think regulations uh you know uh make sense for libertarians because when anything is controlled the market provides so this market is basically the free market you know and the free market kills the economy of the government so milton friedman you know uh he, he there's a youtube documentary as well available online what is the name of that documentary I think uh, uh, handloom. Uh, uh, I think Milton Friedman handloom India. If you just use these keywords, okay. I don't exactly remember All the right. title of the documentary. So right. in that documentary, right. yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. So he he talks about uh, you know how the government is messing up the economy of handlooms and you know uh, it ran out of the business because the government you know didn't introduce technology and the government was not in favor of technology because technology is a threat to the government today we see that the government is very scary of uh, you know blockchain technology and even cryptocurrencies right so you know that reflects the nature of the government that it is really scared of technology because technology makes uh, people to think it empowers individual it expands the size of freedom so you know and th- the way technology is shaping our education system as well like most of the people you know some of the people like in a very gradual way are trying to do self learning so you know it's a threat to the government it's a threat to the revenue of the government that is why you know they will regulate it saying that okay it's not it's not good technology is not good people don't have digital access for example in india uh, only 8 to 10% of total population you know the pop- total population is around 123 crores so out of 123 crore only 8 to 10% have access to internet so the government says okay the 90% do not have access to internet let us not uh, legalize cryptocurrencies you know blockchain technology is a threat to the poor people but why are people poor mm-hmm. that is a basic question a fundamental question we should be asking people are poor because there is too much of government in the lives of the poor people so the rich get richer not on their own the rich get richer only when the government you know favors certain kind of industries so not all the rich people get richer only some section of the rich people get richer so you know free market has not been uh, widely understood you know and the communists have their own version of freedom of market like they say 
free market is not good because it does not empower people. But if you logically do a postmortem of the history of economics, I think capitalism has lifted many people out of poverty. Capitalism has led to innovation. Innovation has led to competition. Competition has actually, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, brought down the prices and it has increased the purchasing power of the people. So I think that's the beauty of capitalism. Right. Yeah, yeah. There's a there's a meme that uh, that reminds you of that, which is like it says, um, you know, you see a you see a city, you know, lit lit up at night with all these different lights, and it says capitalism, the the uh, the system that has funded every other ism in history. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I mean capitalism. I mean we we we. I mean it's it's logically impossible for a capitalist system to coexist with a central banking system. Right, I mean, right, the right. central banking system is not a capitalist system. The right. central banking system is dictatorship of the government right. because they enjoy monopoly on printing money out of thin air. Yeah. So when you have a monopoly on money, you're, you, you're not capitalist. A capitalist believes in voluntary interaction, not mm -hmm. in forced interaction. Yeah. Or the, or the way I like to describe it is uh, the way Murray Rothbard describes it in uh, Anatomy in the State, which is that the uh, the productive and the industrious um, are the ones that are actually contributing to the wealth and resources of the world, and then the state is like the parasite, the tapeworm or the or the tick that is slowly siphoning away resources. Doesn't create anything. Doesn't make anything useful. <laughs> it just siphons away, or we can say steals the nourishment and the productivity uh, from those that are actually doing the work and being industrious and and then of course claims credit for for the entire process <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> or, or another way i like to describe it is you know you see a you see a um <clears throat> a parade right and then somebody jumps in front of the parade and they claim they claim credit for the entire parade <laughs> so that would be the state <laughs> Yeah, yeah, only only if uh, people were introduced to know what exactly is public choice theory, uh, which emerges in 1980s. Mm. I think public choice theory in economics can be a good start for people to understand the economics and the maths of regulations and taxes. Uh, you know, we don't have public choice theory in syllabus, but, you know, if the market, you know, is regulated, then there is a faculty like me who would, you know, introduced about what is public choice theory, what is libertarianism, because every student or every learner should know all the sides of the coin, not just one side of the coin and make a fixed opinion, okay, this is true, this is the reality. I think it's unfair, it's unfair to our civilization and it's completely illogical. Yeah. So so, so let me ask you, um, given that you are a uh, an anarcho-capitalist living in India, um, so I'm, I'm very much more familiar with what's going on, you know, central banking in, you know, with the Federal Reserve in, uh, in the United States. So, so how is the, um, the Indian central bank doing? Is it, is it also, I, I mean, I assume most banks around the most central banks around the world are just creating money, massive amounts of, 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 of currency out of thin air. Um, and, and so I assume India is on the same path of, uh, destroying its currency, right? The, the rupee is like, what was it like? I don't know, a, yeah. a couple of hundred rupees or something. Oh, no, maybe, maybe is it up to 100 rupees uh, per dollar? What's the exchange rate now? Uh, currently, it's 68 rupees per dollar. 68, okay, so, sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah. The, the rupee is depreciating because the government wants to boost exports. So, I mean, you don't have a proper manufacturing policy. Our right. exports are quite lesser compared to imports. And, right. you know, there is a general misconception that imports are always bad, right. exports are good. So I think uh, that's a tragedy. Yeah. So coming to central banking system, I would you know uh, cite Mark Thornton's research paper here. I think he has written a, re a research paper uh, saying that central banks suffer from apoplithorismus phobia, which means uh, the central banks don't love deflation. They love inflation because right. Right. it gives them uh, more access to influence the monetary policy in their own way. Yeah. So currently the central bank is actually also suffering from government intervention. Like there is too much of government control and interference in the central banking affairs. So, you know, they have created recently a monetary policy committee uh, having like five to six people who will 
take a decision before influencing monetary policy. It is so sad to see that just five to six people decide almost the monetary policy of India. Hmm. So the monetary right. policy of India seems to be quite hawkish. They, they, they say they want to fight inflation, but they are fighting the price inflation. They are not fighting the money supply inflation. Uh, so, yeah. you know, it, it's <laughs> like it, it gives the wrong impression to the government. <laughs> right. So, I mean... I, I, I mean, it's, 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 and most of the mainstream is right, writing editorials, blogs. I don't know how many people read it. They, they, they write on, say, price inflation. So the government should interfere. The should. The should is a very dangerous word in this banking system. <laughs> the government should do this. The government right. should do that. Right, right. And once the government, and once the government does it, then they are like, government should not do this. Government should not do this. So what basically you're looking for? I mean, it's completely. It, it's like a system of intellectual masturbation, you know, where they just satisfy their right. <laughs> egoistic arrogance. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And another thing that I I find fascinating with India is that um, Indian culture already understands the importance of precious metals right especially gold and and so it see i remember reading about india how um you know it, it's very difficult for financial institutions in india to convince the indian people to save their wealth in financial instruments like i guess stocks or bonds you know things like that and and they and Indian most Indian people prefer to, to save their wealth in precious metals like gold, and and also I remember reading how how the, the I, I, let, let me know if this is true now, but I remember reading how they were cracking down on imports of precious metals of gold, and so people were trying to smuggle in gold, and there was a lot of cases of people like they found like you know huge duffel bags full of gold bar, gold bars and gold coins because people people just try to smuggle it in as much as they can. Is is this still the case now? Uh, uh, I think it's not so popular as uh, you're talking about. I think there have been few incidents in this regard. Yeah. Uh, coming to the point on culture, I think uh, uh, Indian culture is quite uh, you know multilingual. It's like there is no one uniform culture. Right. In India, uh, you know, with every one mile or five miles, you'll see change in food, change in taste of the water, change in the culture. Good point. So <laughs> it's it's it's, yeah. it's it's a it's a land of many religions. It's a land of many cultures right so uh, and in, in in all these cultures the the common feature is that gold is uh, not just used as a commodity or as an investment uh, it is a, like a cultural product for them it's like you know we import too much of gold because we believe that gold is a sign of prosperity so every mm -hmm. household have some amount of gold where right. they use it for the conspicuous display during marriage events or right. uh, some other reasons so we don't invest in gold. We don't use it as a medium of exchange. You know, it's even illegal to use it as a medium of exchange ah. because it's uh, almost lead to barter exchanges. Hmm. So we use uh, it as, a, you know, uh, as a sign of uh, prosperity, as a sign of your social status. Hmm. So, yeah, I mean, smuggling is due to happen. It's because of regulation of gold phenomena. Right. So, you know. I mean, you can't do anything about it. If you regulate something, people will always demand that more. Because right, that's exactly. How, <laughs> that's how uh, it functions. That's how the nature of humans are. Yeah, exactly. Once you, once you, once the state prohibits something that increases the value of it and the price, <laughs> and then you get black <laughs> markets and you get, you know, gangsters who are willing to, um, who are willing to risk danger in providing that product to people who want it. Right, and people, yeah, people yeah. Who, who are willing to pay for it. Um, so, so yeah, so so please get into some of your videos from your YouTube channel. Um, so yeah, the the um, the taxation of theft, the graffiti one. So so why did you why did you decide to do that one? Uh, yeah, I think uh, inspired from Ron Paul, uh, you know, uh, taxation is theft. Uh, I think uh, uh, there is no market for taxation is theft kind of movement in India. Mm -hmm. I think. Uh, you know, it needs to be introduced. I mean, most of the people are pissed at taxes. We pay taxes on each and everything. I mean, right. we even pay inheritance tax due on our deathbed. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a shame that, you know, we have more taxes than friends in our life. So, <laughs> you know, for each and everything. <laughs> right. So, 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 so we have taxes for each and everything. I mean, it's, it's wrong. I mean, I sometimes I feel that, you know, it, it, it's wrong to exist here. I mean, we pay so many taxes. Even if I were to suicide, the government will say, okay, pay the suicidal tax because we need revenue. What about poor people? I mean, right, right, right. <laughs> paying, paying, paying tax 
taxes is completely you know uh, different from tax spending just because people pay taxes does not mean you know the government would spend according to your whims and wishes right right but there there is no incentive to be accountable in looking after tax spending so mm-hmm. the government spends recklessly despite of paying so many taxes mm-hmm. you know uh, uh, the uh, india's fiscal policy is in deficit our current economy is in deficit i mean where is our taxing uh, you know tax money going so uh, i just thought to make a video on this because i thought uh, you know uh, no, nobody likes to read nowadays people just like to watch videos uh, this is a this is a facebook generation you know so <laughs> yeah <laughs> so gone are the days of people going to the library and reading about human action now they just want in 2 minutes human action summary we don't have time because we invest our time in paying taxes to the government so uh, you know i just thought to make a video on taxation and theft and talk about that how we, how it is a legal robbery so i used deontological arguments like especially how it is moral and immoral to pay voluntarily and to pay by force so it's just a 3.5 minute video and i think as of now i have 5000 views on youtube and 30000 views on facebook so overall 35000 views okay fine out of 35000 views even if 10 people make up their mind okay yeah taxation is theft i think i have done my business so this 10 people are threat to the government is this 10 people you know uh, listen to the principles so it's likely that they are not going to obey with the structure of tax even on twitter i tag income tax india handle see okay this is taxation is in india i mean taxation is theft in india go do do the hack what you want to do it mm-hmm. so uh, i did this video adventurously last uh, year uh, with two of my friends who supported me in buying a graphic tee uh, and uh, shooting the video so it was quite enjoyable and uh, mm-hmm. we shot at night so you know it, it needs to be shot at night so we even saw you know cops you know uh, at night you know trying to check out what's happening in the area so we had to uh, you know police jeep you know uh, halting at our destination and asking what are you doing i said i'm a tourist i'm new to the city i'm just trying to capture pictures they didn't see me doing graffiti otherwise uh, i would be arrested <laughs> uh... but 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 it would make sense if i'm arrested because in india most of the careers come from jail either you become a politician either you become a mafia leader uh, either you become a popular person so jail is like a another educational qualification so hmm. if i'm arrested taxation is theft in india you know it, it becomes popular here <laughs> why i'm trying to talk about in that way is because uh, you need to popularize the movement so that people start having conversations we don't have conversations on tax people are angry people are frustrated but they are not finding a proper uh, argument a proper channel through which they can express you know hmm. that taxation uh, you know we can't have so many taxes like uh, i'll give you some data uh on coming to direct tax uh, you know around uh, uh, 2 to 3% of india's population pays income tax uh the rest everybody pays gst that is goods and service tax which is nothing but indirect tax or consumption tax hmm. so consumption tax is more uh, you know uh, regressive because it also kills the purchasing power of the poor people because uh, the rich and the poor pay the same amount of consumption tax i mean when it comes to the tax rates so the rich those who are smart enough especially the political class they 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 evade paying taxes and you can see that there has been a rise of uh, you know uh, the black money in the swiss bank there has been 50% increase in wealth in swiss bank account now why is there an increase that's because tax is not a good in- incentive so we can have discussions we can have solutions like we can have tax choice we can have a tax consent so we should pay taxes only for those services because you can't suddenly create an anarcho capitalist society or saying that okay we will just pay for the private services that we consume because you know the the economic structure the cultural condition of india is completely different from us i think the good thing about us no doubt is that you have a history of liberty you have mm-hmm. a history of libertarianism india does not have any history of libertarianism yeah. so it's 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 it's, it's a really challenging to introduce taxation is theft on mainstream level so let's see uh, you know uh, how far my video goes how far my understanding is comprehensible in the people so i think it's a wait and watch situation yeah yeah i mean um, <clears throat> you're right that india does not have a history like like um yeah the united states has um yeah i guess murray rothbard and hayek and mises and yeah you're right that uh <laughs> i guess we're very grateful to have those people and uh yeah india so you so you're basically the uh 
I guess you're like the Mises of of India. You know, you you started. You're the first one starting from ground. Like how many how many other volunteers and uh, an anarcho capitalists have you met that 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 were already um, uh, that under, already understood the philosophy? Have you met any or many? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I mean, there's a Facebook group, Indian Libertarian Discussion Group, where I the see, you know see. there are around three to four thousand of libertarians. Libertarians. I, I don't know whether they are. Uh, really libertarians or they are learners but I it see. seems that there are libertarians but the portion is quite less compared to the uh, right. population of status here right. so uh, yeah i i can't uh, you know uh, i i agree with you i mean i love your compliment that i may be a missus of india <laughs> but i think even before me uh, even before me say 60 70 years back we had uh, b r shinoy uh, in 1950s and 60s Who who has been to West and East Germany, and I think uh, his work is not so popular. He himself is not popular because uh, there is no such introduction or there is no statue of him, you know, right. elsewhere in the public sphere. Right. So B R Shinoy was a great economist who talks about you know liberty, minimum size of the government. Mm. Uh, then there is another jurist, Nana Palkiwala. Uh, even uh, C Raja Gopalachari, you know, he has been a politician in 1950s who believed in free markets. So you know. there have been but they are not so popular compared to other politicians so mm. i would credit them as misses of india the the real architect of free market thinking in india i think i, I they are they because they are the ones who got the idea of free market because we were under colonial rule so you know uh, after british leaving india in 1947 we were directly introduced to socialism mm. so you know we never had a you know uh, a free market school of thought and mm -hmm. uh, there are few other folks as well uh, you know like there is one friend whom uh, like madhusudan raj is in baroda university who is also a libertarian there there is a jayant bharadwaj who uh, you know uh, uh, who also talks about liberty uh, he's based in us uh, he comes to india often so yeah amit verma kumar anand i think these are the guys whom i know personally are well established libertarians we do have libertarian think tanks here like the uh, the first is center for civil society uh, i'm not sure about uh, their political leanings but uh, they have produced literature on free market there is liberty india uh, you know coordinated by uh, barun mitra who is also a popular libertarian but it's, it's the popularity is only in our circles i mean not at a, a mainstream level uh you know these are the few established folks you know you can say the old ones who are uh, you know who are the pioneers of libertarianism movement here that's wonderful yeah that's great i mean yeah it's an uphill battle you know i mean it's an uphill battle for us and we do have you know a lot of uh, a good amount of literature and prominent figures but it must be even more difficult for you guys because um you know you don't necessarily have all that um ground you know that foundation um so yeah i really uh i really uh you know credit you guys a lot for doing this work because it's 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 i think spreading um spreading volunteerism and free markets and capitalism is really a thankless job <laughs> like how many people how many people do you meet that say you know jamin thank you very much for spreading volunteerism and anarcho capitalism i really appreciate how many people do you meet that that appreciate your work you know it's most of the time you know You just hate the poor. You just want people to suffer. You want disorder. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, 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 what kind of person wants to do that? I mean, it almost seems like we're like, uh, you know, what do you call that? Um, uh, what is that? Um, masochists, right? We just, we enjoy pain on ourselves, <laughs> right? Does it seem like that? Selfishness is evil, greedy. You right. are greedy. You are evil. <laughs> You'll burn in hell. <laughs> Right, like who wants to do this work? And and most of us don't even get paid for doing this work. So on top of all that criticism, you don't even get paid for it. <laughs> so I uh, yeah, I just want to say thank you very much um, for doing this. You're doing wonderful work, and uh, you know we just we don't we don't get to yeah. hear enough praise for what we do, and uh, I think it takes a, a special type of character, you know, a strength yeah. a strength of character. um integrity you know dignity in oneself right um confidence in in the things that you believe in in your principles to continue every day to talk about this and try to spread it that you know that much farther and uh, i think yeah it's 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 a very unique thing that you have to it's a very unique personality that has to um be 
you know that that that, that um, has to be that way it has to enjoy that kind of discomfort <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but anyway i mean uh, you know it's better to uh, you know live your i mean live your life uh, the way you wish to i mean it does not make sense to live your whole life by kneeling down on your knees i mean it's, it's modern slavery yeah so i think anarchism liberates people yeah. i mean people should research before having any loud opinions yeah and yeah and last but not least you know uh, taxation uh, <laughs> yes theft. it will always be a theft <laughs> <laughs> exactly so so before we go yeah. like uh mention your your other video your man in the street um social experiment and uh yeah talk about uh yeah what you did in the video and um and what it's about and and why you did it uh uh you know it's like uh, uh my mind is quite creative i if you look at my youtube channel you know you know there is a different you know different videos of different theme there is no continuous flow that i follow a particular structure of doing this video so there is a video on taxationist theft there is a video in which i am debunking the concept called nationalism which is also very seditious and controversial in nature then there is one vox pop you know uh, trying to understand the popular opinion so a vox pop on marxism versus libertarianism so i am introducing this verse directly so at least you know before watching the video people get a rough idea what exactly i'm doing so in that video uh, i i conducted a social experiment in which i'm trying to understand uh, you know popularity of karl marx popularity of marxism ideology and trying to compare with how many of them have been introduced to uh, about right wing thinkers like ludwig uh, von mises uh, f frederick hayek b r shinoy you know ayn rand so just wanted to do a social experiment that you know whether people are really introduced to such ideas so shockingly and i i was expecting the outcome in, uh, because i am quite familiar that people love marxism because they have been taught about marxism and they believe that only marxism has a monopoly on talking about poverty but that is not the case i think uh, marxism you know has just created the system of gulag where you are just killed for voicing your opinion mm. so i conducted this video with different age groups like i i asked uh, you know the taxi unions i asked the students i asked the general audience on whom do, do they know you know so only one person could out make out out of so many people like i i interviewed around seven to eight people so out of which only one person could say that okay i know she's ain rand because i have read a novel called fountain head or uh, anthem <laughs> wow. The rest were like, okay, he's Karl Marx, he's Karl Marx, he's Karl Marx. You said, uh, you, said you, shows... you said seventy-eight people you interviewed. Yeah, seven, seven to eight people. Oh, seven to eight. Oh, sorry, sorry. Seventy-eight. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, like every year, I uh, encounter with three hundred to four hundred students. Yeah. Uh, in my academic capacity per year, uh, in my personal, you know, academic capacity, I encounter three hundred to four hundred people anyway. Yeah. So. Uh, you know uh, so yeah most of them are socialists by default so anyway it's an opportunity for me to economically make them think so coming to this video uh, you know uh, the outcome was like almost expected i didn't uh, you know try to interfere with outcome or something as such and it was just a 5 to 6 7 minutes video where i was entering a classroom asking a bunch of students that okay guys whom do you know this so even over there mao zedong is popular so this social experiment was to highlight that how are we doing wrong with education how are we doing wrong with certain economic thinking so that is a hidden conclusion of this video and i think uh, you know somewhere i think libertarians need to organize themselves and you know work towards this direction where uh, we are depopularizing karl marx because the idea of communism is very dangerous it has taken it has killed more people than people have killed people so you know somewhere we need to know the line yes yes it's a, it's really amazing how people intuitively understand uh the horrors of nazism and you know hate hitler rightly so right um however they have a a special place a special warm place in their heart for communism and socialism which comparatively has killed many many more people and uh you know enslaved many people uh and i mean is currently enslaving actually even today um and and it's and it's really amazing how it's like a blind spot you know in their mind that they have for these um these regimes uh and and i guess you can you can really uh 
credit that due you know to the government schooling right that uh that they yeah. they believe that the state is necessary for the smooth functioning of society you know without the state you know we would just uh you know be working uh 18 hour days no bathroom breaks no vacations you know infants and toddlers would be working <laughs> <laughs> we we would be eating poison sandwiches and you know appliances would explode in our face if without the minimum wage without all these osha regulations without <laughs> Without all this stuff, thank goodness for the state to bring order to our lives. <laughs> like, like this is really this is really how people think, right? And uh, and so it, it's it's a very difficult task to convince people otherwise because uh, you know they're so emotionally wrapped up in it. You know, all their lives, their parents and then teachers, right, have been saying this over and over and over again. And so, how do you how do you work to disentangle? All of that confusion, it's very difficult, right? True. It's, it's, it's quite challenging. And, you know, uh, even your profession could be at stake if you are being quite bold and vocal here. Right. You know, if you, if you take freedom of speech uh, ranking of India, uh, we rank at 138 out of 190 countries. Hmm. So by this, you can make out the judgment that in India, you know, there is no freedom of speech here. Hmm. So we I have to be extra careful on what I'm saying, why I'm saying it, right. because... Well, people are quite emotional, you know, for them, feelings are more important than facts. Right. So, yeah, so, you know, you, you, we also need to be, you know, I think somewhere the libertarians need to, uh, you know, emotionalize the content. We are quite intellectual in our way. So that does not incentivize people to listen to us. So somewhere we need to create case studies or stories in a very simple or a layman words, you know, where people are able to identify themselves with the problem. I think that could be a very uh, beautiful strategy in which we can popularize our idea, our school of thought. In fact, libertarians are more poor, more pro poor than uh, communist because we believe in freedom and we want uh, all the people of every strata to be free. Right. Uh, right. Yeah. So I think this is where uh, you know we can use it as a USP because that is in our nature. Otherwise, the communists are going to transform economics into a dismal science or a rock. Pet science <laughs> before you know we fail our humanity somewhere we need to introspect quickly and you know organize beautiful strategies to track down on them yeah and, and you know talking about how you know you say libertarians and, and anarcho capitalists are the most pro poor or i mean we we advocate for the poor and to help them out of poverty it's that you know the primary reason that people um stay in poverty is I think a combination of a few things, one of which is the welfare state, right? People get paid to not work, to be idle. And in addition to taxation, all the all the various taxes keeping people in poverty, <laughs> you know, yeah. just stealing, constantly sure. stealing money, you know, well, like 50% probably in total combined income tax with everything else, 50, maybe 60%, just co complete outright theft. And how much of that is actually keeping people in poverty, you know, and yet people tend to think that the state is necessary or else we'd all suffer. <laughs> <laughs> so I think uh, freedom is necessary. I mean, freedom comes, uh, you know, um, it, it's, an, it's a God's gift. It's a nature's gift that we need to naturally and rationally embrace it. So when you have, uh, you know, for example, uh, when our families or when our parents are conservative or when they are more like a nanny state, the kids are liable to make more mistakes. Mm. So when the parents are more thinking like a libertarian or more flexible in their way of living, so kids do make mistakes, but they learn from their mistakes. So similarly, using this as a parameter to understand uh, the ideology of uh, you know the state and anarchism, I think uh, we are all going to make mistakes, but in the scope of uh, not repeating the same mistake is higher in anarchism than in statism. So, you know, this is where, you know, uh, I think uh, we make sense. Yeah. Yes, definitely. I definitely agree. Um, well, wonderful conversation, Jeremy. Thank you very much for uh, for talking to me, for joining me. It's really excellent, very informative. Um, so before we go, just um, can you please reiterate your um, ways that people can um, can contact you if they want to follow you and your work? Yeah, I, I think uh, I, if you want to follow Satire, follow me on Facebook. If you want to have decent conversations, follow me on Twitter. 
stay subscribed to my youtube because there is more seditious and that's famous videos coming in <laughs> wonderful <laughs> <laughs> um and and uh, and one thing i ask of all my guests before we go i'm, I'm sure you know this that uh, if you if you watch yeah. some of my other videos <laughs> what is your favorite quote of all time uh i think uh, i would cite the uh, you know uh, george orwell who was actually a socialist but somewhere i think his leanings were towards libertarian right, right. so his thought his thought his quote could uh, you know uh, literally help his own followers socialist followers to relearn or introspect their policies the quote would be all animals are equal but some are more equal than others <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah animal farm animal farm um i think it's required yeah. you know what you know what's strange i think um i think it's animal farm or 1984 i forget which or maybe both is required reading in government school which is very ironic <laughs> <laughs> true i mean uh the communist and the socialist can you know uh should relearn george orwell because yeah, right. you know uh they say George Orwell was, uh, you know, a socialist. How can you quote him? Yeah. I mean, come on. I mean, you don't have a monopoly on George Orwell. George Orwell, <laughs> you know, I, you, he, he indirectly hinted at his uh, own ideological commitment. Yeah. So, yeah, I think looking at such quotes and looking at the way he has written books on uh, Animal Farm in 1984, I think he was a, a kind of a individualist who believed in freedom. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely, I definitely. I also think so, as well. And and yeah. uh, uh, and Aldous Huxley, Brave New World, also in, along a similar vein, you know, as uh, George Orwell too. You know, very forward thinking um, uh, authors. So yeah, wonderful conversation, uh, Jamin. Thank you very much for joining me. I really appreciate it. Uh, so please, everyone, um, check him out on Facebook, on YouTube, on Twitter. I think he's producing wonderful content. Uh, from India, and you know, he gives a fresh perspective on the in this uh, on the these principles that I think so many people uh, need help in understanding. And you know, the more people around the world that embrace uh, these this philosophy, the better, you know, more prosperous we'll be um, as human beings. And you know, it's just it's a pleasure to me to see when I see groups like you know, I see I see groups on Facebook like volunteers in Pakistan, volunteers in India, you know, volunteers in Russia, like all over the world, these these groups are popping up. And it just makes me so happy to see that slowly the seeds are being planted. And actually, I don't know if you heard the interview that I did with um uh oh, actually <laughs> I think it's in. I think it's um, translated. It's from Nelson Chartran. He's a he's an anarcho capitalist from Cuba, from communist Cuba. <laughs> that was an amazing interview. That's very nice. Say again. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Interesting. I, yeah. I need to check them out. And you know, the uh, our brothers in the U.S. need not feel alone. I mean, yeah, the seeds of volunteerism and libertarianism is gradually spreading across yeah. uh, the countries. So libertarianism is just not in the U.S. It's it's gradually yeah. it's, it's an infancy stage in Asia and Africa. Oh, it's beautiful, and and I have and that's a major reason why I have so much hope um, for the for a bright future. You know, I I'm extremely optimistic when it comes to the future. I uh, and I'm just helping to spread it that much farther and that much faster before I die. That's my that's only my only goal. <laughs> awesome. Just encourage it that much more. So yeah, great conversation, Jimmy. Thank you very much for joining me. Uh, so this is Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network on, on SOLpodcast.org and theconsciousresistance.com. Wishing all of you have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this content and would like to see more of it, please feel free to donate and help me interview other fascinating people. You can do so through Patreon. That's patreon.com slash peacefulanarchism to help me out. A dollar a show is all I ask. If you feel so inclined to donate more, please feel free. It will only assist me in spreading the message of freedom and volunteerism that much farther and that much more efficiently. You can also donate to my Bitcoin. My Bitcoin address is in the description to my videos as well as on my website, peacefulanarchism.com. And while you're on my site, there's a donate button to donate through PayPal. 
if you prefer to donate through PayPal, you can do so with that. But Patreon is a little bit easier for content creators as you can set up a recurring donation if you so desire. Also, while you're on my website, peacefulanarchism.com, please feel free to sign up, enter your email address, sign up for my newsletter, and you'll receive updates every time I post something, a video or an interview. I do not send out any spam. Or you can also follow me on Facebook under facebook.com slash peaceful anarchism or facebook.com slash Danilo Cuellar 3, I believe. Danilo Cuellar 3. So either either one of those methods, if you are able to donate, I would be most appreciative. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you have a magnificent day. Cell 411 is a free app for Android and iOS that replaces government-controlled 911. Cell 411 allows you to preset a group of friends or private organizations to show up in any emergency. Cell 411 is a nightmare for the state because it proves their so-called services aren't needed. Cell 411 has had thousands of installs, and of course it's covered by the Bipcot No Government License. Cell 411 because your friends won't shoot you when you're in trouble. Without the government, who would build the emergency services? You and Cell 411. Get it today at GetCell411.com. That's GetCell411.com.